Since sitting down, he had felt curiously warm. Smee, he said, this seat is hot. He jumped up. Oh, bobs, hammer and tongs, I'm burning! They examined the mushroom, which is of a size and solidity unknown on the mainland. They tried to pull it up, and it came away at once in their hands, for it had no root. Stranger still, smoke began at once to ascend. The pirates looked at each other. A chimney! they both exclaimed. They had indeed discovered the chimney of the home under the ground. It was the custom of the boys to stop it with a mushroom when enemies were in the neighbourhood. Not only smoke came out of it, there also came children's voices, for so safe did the boys feel in their hiding place that they were gaily chattering. The pirates listened grimly and then replaced the mushroom. They looked around them and noted the holes in the seven trees. Did you hear them say Peter Pan's from home? Smee whispered, fidgeting with Johnny Corkscrew. Hook nodded. He stood for a long time, lost in thought, and at last a curdling smile lit up his swarthy face. Smee had been waiting for it. Unrip your plan, Captain, he cried eagerly. To return to the ship, Hook replied slowly through his teeth, and cook a large rich cake of a jolly thickness with green sugar on it. There can be but one room below, for there is but one chimney. The silly moles had not the sense to see that they did not need a door apiece. That shows they have no mother. We will leave the cake on the shore of the mermaid's lagoon. These boys are always swimming about there, playing with the mermaids. They will find the cake and they will gobble it up. Because, having no mother, they don't know how dangerous it is to eat rich damp cake. He burst into laughter, not hollow laughter now, but honest laughter. Ah, ha, 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 they will die. Smee had listened with growing admiration. It's the wickedest, prettiest policy I've ever heard of, he cried, and in their exultation they danced and sang. A vast belay when I appear, by fear they're overtook. Noughts left upon your bones when you have shaken claws with hook. They began the verse, but they never finished it, for another sound broke in and stilled them. There was at first such a tiny sound that a leaf might have fallen on it and smothered it, but as it came nearer, it was more distinct. Tick, tick, tick. Hook stood, shuddering, one foot in the air. The crocodile, he gasped, and bounded away followed by his bosun. It was indeed the crocodile. It had passed the redskins, who were now on the trail of the other pirates. It oozed on after Hook. Once more, the boys emerged into the open, but the dangers of the night were not yet over, for presently Nibs rushed breathless into their midst, pursued by a pack of wolves. The tongues of the pursuers were hanging out. The baying of them was horrible. Save me, save me, cried Nibs, falling on the ground. But what can we do? What can we do? It was a high compliment to Peter that at that dire moment their thoughts turned to him. What would Peter do? They cried simultaneously. Almost in the same breath they cried, Peter would look through them, through his legs. And then, let us do what Peter would do. It was quite the most successful way of defying wolves. And as one boy, they bent and looked through their legs. The next moment is the long one, but victory came quickly. For as the boys advanced upon them in the terrible attitude, the wolves dropped their tails and fled. Now Nibs rose from the ground, and the others thought that his staring eyes still saw the wolves. But it was not the wolves he saw. I have seen a wonderful a thing, he cried, as they gathered round him eagerly. A great white bird. It is flying this way. What kind of bird, do you think? I don't know, Nibs said, awestruck. But it looks so weary. And as it flies, it moans, poor Wendy. Poor Wendy? I remember, said Slightly instantly. There are birds called Wendy's. See, it comes, cried Curly, pointing to Wendy in the heavens. Wendy was now almost overhead, and they could hear her plaintive cry. But more distinct came the shrill voice of Tinkerbell. The jealous fairy had now cast off all disguise of friendship and was darting at her victim from every direction, pinching savagely each time she touched. Hello, Tink, cried the wondering boys. Tink's reply rang out. Peter wants you to shoot the Wendy. 